Scott Aniel, and you're listening to By the Waters of Babylon, a podcast dedicated to discussion of Christianity in a post-Christian culture. The terms culture, ethnicity, and race are terms and categories that are often blurred together in very unhelpful ways, and that is the subject of the episode today. But before we get into that, I'd like to ask a request of you. If you enjoy the podcast, there are a couple things that you can do to help to spread the reach of this podcast. The reach of podcasts is largely dependent upon listeners like you. So there are at least three things that you can do. First, you can subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform is your preference, whether it be a specific podcasting platform like Apple Podcasts or even YouTube. All of the episodes are on my YouTube channel as well. Subscribe there, and that will make sure that you are notified when a new episode is posted. Number two, go on to Apple Podcasts and give the podcast a five-star rating. The more ratings on Apple Podcasts, the more visibility for the podcast. And then third, share the podcast on social media. It would be helpful if you could do that, whether it be Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever platforms you use, share the podcast, and that will help to spread the word. Well, recently on Twitter, there's been a couple different discussions that have once again revealed the blurring of important categories in very unhelpful ways that actually, I believe, stir division and also do not help us to think biblically about some important ideas. As I mentioned earlier, the three categories are culture, ethnicity, and race. Often these categories are blurred together, and that has been revealed once again in some online discussion. The first occurred recently when Laramie Minga, who is a friend of mine, uh, he was one of my PhD students at Southwestern, took him all the way through his dissertation prospectus before the PhD students were uh, taken away from me when I came to G3. But Laramie Minga uh, posted on Twitter the following. At the 2023 SBC annual meeting, can the music just be rich, singable hymns with simple accompaniment instead of the charismatic rock concert? And then he tagged the two candidates who are running for SBC president at this year's annual meeting. So he's just using the election of a new SBC president to encourage better singing at the national meeting. And I know exactly what he's talking about. I've watched live streams of the SBC annual meeting, and the last couple in particular were highly produced, emotionally charged musical times with instrumentation that is very loud, songs that are more performance-oriented rather than actually encouraging congregational singing. They're songs that objectively are not singable for average congregations. So essentially what you have is talented musicians on a stage performing songs in a way in which the congregation really can't sing. So it's not congregational worship. It's not congregational singing. It is, in a sense, a Christian rock concert. It's a performance. And as I've noted even recently in some blog articles and podcast episodes, uh, heavily influenced by charismatic theology of worship. And so Laramie is using this opportunity both to emphasize the need for true, biblically regulated, singable hymns within a congregational setting, and then also, of course, making comments about uh, the SBC in general. Well, one of the replies to his tweet came from Dwight McKissick. Dwight McKissick is a pastor in Texas, and he is widely known as someone who likes to make everything about ethnicity. He really seems to enjoy stirring up ethnic division. And his reply to Laramie's tweet was the following. Not so subtle attack on J.D. Greer and his African-American worship leader. I sat in Birmingham 19 and literally worshipped and cried with joy and gratitude that I was attending an SBC convention where the worship was so reminiscent of church worship that blended the best of African-American and Anglo worship. Now this! Exclamation point. So in other words, McKissick is making... Laramie's comments an issue of ethnicity. Laramie is commenting about the kind of songs that are sung and how they are led, and McKissick assumes that this has to do with ethnicity. 
He, of course, is commenting on the last couple conventions in which the leader happened to be an African-American and there happened to be African-Americans on stage. Laramie made no comment about the color of the skin of the leaders of worship at the SBC meeting. He was commenting about the cultural forms, and therein lies the problem. McKissick is blurring the categories of ethnicity and culture. And this is very common. Evangelicals for quite some time now, and really, as I'll mention in a moment, people in general in Western civilization tend to blur the categories of ethnicity and culture. The problem is they are not the same thing. They are not the same thing biblically, as we will see in a moment. To make comments or even criticize cultural expressions is not to make comments or criticize particular skin color or particular ethnicity, which even those are not equal categories, which we'll talk about in a moment. So let's spend a few moments first talking about the idea of culture, which is, again, what Laramie was referencing, the kind of music, the kind of cultural expressions. Historically, the term culture is a relatively new term. It's not a biblical term. You won't find it in scripture. And it's not a term or a category that was used for roughly the first 1,700 years of Western civilization. The term is older. It has roots in Latin discussions of agriculture. That's literally where it came from. But as early as about 1776, the term began to be used metaphorically to describe what we might call high culture, what Matthew Arnold would later call the best which has been thought and said in the world. The term was first used by a German philosopher, Johann Gottfried Herder, in 1776 in his book, Reflections on the Philosophy of History, in which he argued that each civilization progresses through a process of enlightenment, at which point it begins to produce culture. So in other words, the more advanced a civilization, the more possible for that civilization to produce culture. And again, he's using it to refer to the arts, to high culture and those sorts of things. And by the way, I deal with this history of the term and idea of culture extensively in my book, By the Waters of Babylon. If you're interested in diving deeper, I'd encourage you to get a copy of that book. But Herder's use introduced that word for describing differences among people groups. And again, originally, it referred to differences that resulted in the production of high culture, of artistic expressions. However, later, with the rise of the discipline of cultural anthropology, the term and idea of culture took more of what its present form is today. Darwinian evolution influenced all aspects of human philosophy and inquiry in the mid-19th century, including explanation of why different civilizations behave in different ways, cultural differences. For example, Edward Tyler, who is known as the founding father of British anthropology, developed a theory of cultural evolution that described stages of human history from primitivism to advancement. He was building off of Herder's ideas of culture. Tyler's attempt to explain differences among various groups of people led to the formation of the discipline of cultural anthropology. And this new discipline was involved with describing and interpreting and analyzing similarities and differences in human cultures. But it's important at this point to recognize that what Herder is discussing and even what Tyler is discussing in early anthropology is the way people in different civilizations behave, how they live, how they act, the arts and customs that are produced within a civilization, within a group of people. So the question for Christians then becomes, what in scripture should inform our understanding of this idea of culture? Because again, it's not a biblical term, but we certainly can find discussions within scripture that would apply to what later Herder and then eventually Tyler and anthropology described when they used the word culture. Again, culture referring to the customs, behaviors, expressions, lifestyles, habits, 
and expressions of a particular group of people. Well, commonly, what Christians have in recent times often pointed to in Scripture is that culture is the same thing as ethnicity. And that word ethnicity is a biblical word. It comes from the Greek word ethnos. And Christians writing about culture often say culture and ethnicity are the same thing. For example, Mark Driscoll in one of his books equated race, nation, and culture, alluding to Revelation chapter 7 verse 9, which we'll actually talk about in a moment, to the idea of culture. He said, God promised that people from every race, culture, language, and nation will be present to worship him as their culture follows them into heaven. He's equating culture and ethnicity, and that is very common among evangelicals. So are they equivalent categories? Well, in the New Testament, of the 164 times that the word ethnos appears, it's translated in the English Standard Version as Gentile 96 times, nation 68 times, pagans three times, and people two times. So what is this word? Well, the word ethnos, according to common Greek lexicons, refers to groups of people who live together and have a common ancestry, a common heritage, and a common history. Notice that the word ethnos, even in how it's translated in the New Testament and how it's used elsewhere in the Greek-speaking world, ethnos does not refer to how people live, how people behave, the arts that they produce, or the customs that describe them. Ethnos refers to groups of people. In other words, culture, which refers to behavior, the way we act, the way we express ourselves, is different from ethnicity, which refers to people groups themselves. Behavior, biblically speaking, must and can be evaluated. How we live, how we behave, how we act, all of these things reflect what we believe. The culture that a particular group of people develops is a reflection of their worldview, of their religion, what they believe and what they value. That says nothing about the people themselves, nothing about the people group itself, the ethnicity. Culture refers to the way we act, and the way we act biblically is a reflection of what we believe and what we value. And so as Christians, we ought to evaluate how we live. We ought to evaluate the ways in which we express ourselves and ask the question, how does this expression reflect the way I believe? Or does it not reflect the way that I believe? And if it doesn't, then we ought to evaluate it and change the way that we express ourselves. Now, when it comes to expressions in worship, which is what Laramie was referring to, what we're talking about is culture. We're talking about something that can and should be evaluated based on whether it is consistent with our Christian beliefs. And so we ought to develop a biblical theology of worship. We ought to develop a theology of worship in which we emphasize the congregational participation, congregational singing, and those values and that theology then ought to influence how we behave, the choices that we make in worship. And that's all that Laramie was asking. Rooted in a theology of worship that says the congregation ought to be active participants, not simply watch performers on a stage, but actually participating in the congregational singing, can we have music that actually facilitates that? He's making comments about culture. McKissick's response brought ethnicity into the equation. And, of course, he's making large assumptions about what Laramie was commenting on to begin with. But the important element here to recognize is that there is nothing inherent about certain ethnicities that ties them to certain cultural expressions. In other words, even if what Laramie was commenting about, a kind of worship that is more about performance on a stage than congregational participation, even if that kind of worship expression is common among African-American churches, 
which is not necessarily true. But even if that were true, that doesn't mean that Laramie is criticizing African-American churches. He's criticizing behavior, not people. And biblically speaking, that is what we ought to be doing as Christians. Again, we ought to evaluate if how we are acting is truly reflecting what we believe. And then the next day, there was another tweet that revealed a similar blurring of these sorts of distinctions. This tweet was by Jackie Hill Perry, a popular speaker in sort of the Gospel Coalition T4G circles on the topic of ethnicity or race, and even there are categories that are blurred that are not the same thing. There is one human race and multiple ethnicities, again, ethnicity referring to people. Well, Jackie Perry tweeted the following, Some of y'all really believe we're going to be in heaven ethnicity-less. Like, what do you think, quote, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, means? So Perry there, of course, is quoting from the book of Revelation, where we find a text that talks about people from every tribe, nation, people, language, worshiping around the throne of heaven. And she's using that to say, this means that every ethnicity will be in heaven. Well, first of all, in one sense, she's exactly right. Those terms do describe ethnicity. The term nation in those passages in the book of Revelation is the word ethnos. And other words in those passages, tribes, peoples, languages, are other words that are near synonyms that describe groups of people, people groups with common heritage from around the world throughout history. And so in one sense, she's right. Those verses mean that in heaven will be people not just from one ethnicity, for instance, not just the Jewish ethnicity, not just one ethnicity, but people from many, from all ethnicities around the world and throughout history will surround the throne of heaven. This is why in Matthew 28, 19, Jesus commands his followers to teach all nations. Again, using the word ethnos there and telling us we ought to go out into all the world and gather together all people who are made in the image of God. Again, one race who need to hear the gospel, who need to be saved. And God promises that one day, praise the Lord, people from every tribe, from every nation, from every people, will be saved and will be in heaven, surrounding the throne room of God and giving him praise. Absolutely. The central problem with Perry's comment here is the emphasis upon maintaining difference, separation, and division among people groups within the body of Christ. And this, again, is very common in Christian discussions of ethnicity today. What she's implying here with her tweet is that we ought to be divided, and that those divisions will be maintained even in heaven. But this is a misinterpretation and misunderstanding of these passages in Revelation and even in the Great Commission of Matthew 28, 19. For instance, D.A. Carson, in his commentary on the book of Matthew, makes the point that Matthew uses that word ethne to mean all people without distinction, all nations without distinction. In other words, the point of the command is not to emphasize the distinctions, but the fact that Jesus commands us to make disciples of people everywhere without distinction. And the same thing is true in the book of Revelation. When Revelation 5, 9 says, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you are slain, and by your blood you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. The verse is not meant to emphasize division, but the fact that people out from, that's what the Greek word means in that text, from, ak, out from, people out from every ethnicity will be united together into one new people. Christians are a new ethnicity taken out of all the ethnicities of the earth. The idea here is not to stress differences and fuel division, certainly not division that will continue even in heaven, 
the emphasis here is on the unity of the body of Christ. And this is an amazing thing about the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ takes people out of every ethnicity, which in this present world are often divided, and unites them together with no distinction into one newly distinct ethnicity, the church. There will absolutely be many colors in heaven. There will be people from every nation and tribe and language and people in heaven. But we will all be united together in one body under Christ as our head. United, ironically, in worship. Worship of the Lamb who was slain. It is not helpful to emphasize division among ethnicity in this present age within the church. Rather, we should have a foretaste of that unity that is to come. We should be emphasizing the unity of the body of Christ. We are not hyphenated Christians, African-American Christians, German-American Christians, white Christians, black Christians, Asian Christians, etc. No. We are Christians, pure and simple. We have come out from the various ethnicities of the world, and we are now united into a new ethnicity, the body of Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening to By the Waters of Babylon. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or other podcasting services, and if you enjoy the podcast, please give it a rating. You can find me on Twitter at twitter.com slash scottannual, I blog at g3min.org, and for articles, audio, and speaking itinerary, visit scottannual.com. Join me next time as we discuss issues related to Christianity in a post-Christian culture. <music>